All right, so I think the recording started now. Okay, so today we're going to just have a, a brief introduction about what this course is about. And we're going to start talking about algorithms and how we analyze efficiency of algorithms, okay? So, but first, uh, um, some course information. I hope that you have already, the course website is at uh, dsc40b.com. Okay, so this is in the email that you received. This information is also available in Campus Fire. Um, by the way, if you haven't received any email invitation to Campus Fire, please let Justin or me know. Uh, we'll send you the invitation. Okay. All right. So um, I think there's some feedback. Uh, uh, feel free to ask questions. However, when you're not asking questions, please unmute yourself so that we don't have the feedback. Okay, um, I hope you have a chance to look at the syllabus on the course website, which also contains some other uh, Q&As, okay? So let me just go over some of the key points of this class here. Uh, for my session, my personal office hour is Thursday 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m., basically after Thursday's class. The Zoom link would be the same as this Zoom link, same password, okay? And the discussion session, I believe, is Thursday afternoon, uh, 4 p.m. or 4.30 forgot it's on the website. Um, now a lot of uh, we use Campus Wire as, um, as a platform where you can ask questions where other students may answer the question or TA the grader or the instructors may answer the question but if you don't feel comfortable sending certain questions or you have other concerns feel free to reach out to me anytime uh, at my email address. This is my email here okay and uh, the Zoom information I assume you already know since you are here. Um, Okay, there are going to be uh, eight homeworks, okay, roughly speaking, one homework per week, other than the last week. There will be two midterms, and you want to mark your calendar for midterm one is on February 4th, and midterm two is 25th. I think both are um, Thursdays, okay. Um, uh, we are going to uh, have an interesting, the following um, uh, framework. So there is actually going to be something called a midterm redemption, okay? You can read more on the course website in the syllabus, the Q&As. So basically, uh, what happens is that on March 13th, this is the, 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 the official, the final exam time for this class, you can actually take redemption midterms. You, don't, you can take just say only the redemption for midterm one or only the redemption for midterm two or both. Okay, and you can keep the, uh, in case you didn't do well in the midterm, and you can keep the higher grade for that. Okay, and you don't have to do that. If you're happy with your midterm performance, you don't have to do that. Okay, now uh, this quarter is a little bit tight. So we decided that the, the, tight, the final exam time and the last class is very close. So we decide that uh, instead of the final exam, we have one we call the super homework. Okay. So the super homework would cover the last uh, several, uh, I think two weeks basically, which essentially uh, material not covered in the first two midterms, okay? So this is, you can think of this as a, a take home final exam, but with a longer period of time. It is due in the final exam week, we'll give you precisely instructions by then, okay? And from the grading point of view, the homework assignments, the eight ones, other than the last final one, last the super homework, then take 40%, okay? And each of the midterm takes 25% of the grading. Again, you can take the uh, redemption if you didn't do well, okay? And um, the final super homework take 10% of the grading. However, one important thing is I want to make sure that uh, the um, you master the material. So um, in order to get a passing grade, okay, you have to be more than 60% in, in grades in each of the midterm, okay? This can be your first try of the midterm or can be your um, uh, the redemption midterm, whichever is higher, okay? So you have to be uh, higher than 60% in both of the midterms for their redemptions in order to pass this class, all right? If you have further questions, feel free to ask me later. All right, so um, we also have this uh, slip days, uh, uh, which basically 
um, each student, each of you have up for four sick days, which you can use throughout the entire quarter. Essentially, um, the way that the homework works is that usually we give homework on Tuesday and then it will be due the next Tuesday. Um, you basically have one uh, whole week to work on that. But uh, in case there is some uh, unforeseen scenario that you need more time, you can use one of your slip day to extend the deadline of the homework. And the, the slip days cannot be stacked, okay? And uh, you are responsible for counting your own slip days and in the end we will um, uh, count for four of them, up to four of them, okay? Okay, um, the homework, as we said, is a big portion of the uh, this uh, class. Um, you are, in, you can discuss homework with your classmates and even though it's a bit harder during the COVID um, uh, time, but in fact, you're encouraged, encouraged to discuss with um, others because very often during the discussion, uh, you understand the concepts better. However, it is very important that you have to write your final solutions individually away from others, okay? This is um, what we find is that um, even when you feel that you understand everything, when you discuss with others, okay, sometimes you have to do it yourself to make sure that you understand all the details, okay? The final doing this uh, individually is extremely helpful to you um, in terms of learning and understanding, okay? So re we require that you cannot, um, uh, the, the final solution has to be written independently, okay? All right, let's see what else. Um, now, th this class is a little bit different from the standard algorithm class, including the undergraduate algorithm class in say computer science department, okay? Um, we're going to use um, mostly, you will see a lot of the details are going to be in the slides, okay? There's also a course note produced by Dr. Justin Eldridge, the other instructor, which is available on the course website. The, here's the link. And um, the material, however, is also pretty standard. So you can find them in the uh, classical textbook, the most popular textbook is the following. This is the one by Corman et al., which I refer to as CLRS, okay, the Introduction to Algorithm. This is, um, this is a big white book and a uh, quite standard um, textbook for both undergraduate and the graduate level algorithms. Covers a lot of uh, uh, topics and materials, but we're going to only use a subset of that, okay? So very often you will see on the course website, we will write, um, in terms of the course note by uh, Dr. Eldridge, which chapter you should uh, read. Uh, in my slide, I will also aim to write down the chapter number in this book by Common et al., which I refer to. I will refer to that as CLRS, okay? Um, now, um, the sometimes, in fact, uh, often, because in this class, we want to make sure that you understand a lot of the basic concepts, okay? Uh, the chapters in CLRS, this textbook, may go deeper, okay? So you can read it at um, the level that's comparable to what we covered in, the, uh, in class in the slides, okay? Another very nice uh, textbook for algorithm is um, by uh, Dasgupta Pavnichos and the Vizarani, and uh, Dr. Dasgupta is from Computer Science Department here. Okay, so um, we will not particularly use that, but this is a very nice reference book if you want to read more about algorithms, okay? All right, by the way, feel free to write your questions in chat. If I can answer in class, I'll do that. If it's too complicated, I'll do it offline, okay? All right. Okay, so that is the high level description uh, about the class, okay? What, regarding what topics we will cover in the class, you can uh, consult the syllabus on the course website, okay? But here, let me first start with a very brief overview what we want to do in this course. All right, so you are all, um, already taken a DSC 40A, which is the first in the sequence. Um, now, essentially, if you think about it, so you're in the data science program and very often um, the, the whole data analysis pipeline starts with data, okay? When we're given, when we're presented with data, the first, and with a task that you want to do with data, the first thing that um, we want to do is that we want to formalize that. How do we model the target task from data, okay? In some sense, that's what you learned and that's the focus of DSC 40A. 
Okay. Um, that in particular, how do we, um, how you are given the problem, say how to tie your shoelace, but then you want to model this in a precise way so that later you can feed it to a computer to help you to tackle this. Okay. All right. Let's just uh, let's review one simple example from BSC 40A. Okay. Let's say that um, we have a simple uh, prediction task. Okay. We're given data where um, for a lot of users, uh, people will have their years of experience and their salary. Okay. What we would like to do is that from a given year of experience, we would like to predict what this person's salary could be. Of course, I mean, the problem can be higher dimensional, can be a bit more complicated, where instead of the years of experience, we can also have other variables, say, the GPS of, this, of the student when they graduate from uh, college, okay? And then we also have their salary data. And now the prediction is that we want to, based on the existing, this different variables, like a GPA and the years of experience, we would like to predict what the salary this uh, students after graduation they may have, okay? Now, if you think that what we did in the uh, DSC 40A is that one way is that we say, okay, one way to model this is that we do a linear regression. We basically, given that we plot the data where um, the, 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 uh, you plot um, the salary against all the variables, GPN, experience, and so on, okay, then now we want to find the best hyperplane that fitting this point with the least amount of total error, where the total error, there are different ways to, to measure that, but we assume that we're going to use the so-called sum square distance to measure the error. Essentially, you find this best plane so that the total distance from each of the points to this plane, the total sum of those square distance is minimized, okay? And um, there are other ways to model this problem as well. This is one uh, typical way. And the nice thing is that if you model this way, then it turns out that after ultimately, okay, what we need to solve is that our variable that's uh, to describe this hyperplane is in this. Um, let's, uh, put this. It's in this omega. That's our variable, okay. And x is your input data matrices. And we essentially want to basically uh, solve this linear system in order to, um, to build this model, to do, build this linear regression model. Okay, so that's essentially what we did in um, uh, the pipeline we learned in the uh, BSC 48. Okay, all right, but we don't just stop there, right? So we have this model. Um, but how do you compute it, find this, compute this vector omega from your data matrices, okay? And if it's very small scale, you can just manually, you can compute a matrix modification and then you can invert it and then solve it yourself if it's very small size, okay? But in general, uh, if you have thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions data points and um, uh, very high dimensions, we cannot afford to do that, okay? So what do we do, okay? How do we use computer to do it for us? Okay. Of course, you may say that I've seen it. We've seen this in DSC 40A. I can ask the Python to do it for us. Okay, we just import this uh, data matrix and then we, we call a function and then Python will just solve it for us. Okay, indeed, this is an algorithm which we're going to focus on in this class, but we um, just calling it, but here you didn't really do this, Python did. Python um, implemented this algorithm for you, okay? So an algorithm essentially is what Python did inside how he implemented this um, uh, uh, procedure, this function here, okay? Um, the, the, your, the, the Python language is, uh, to implement this uh, function, it needs to give a sequence of steps in order, of some basic commands in order to achieve, to, to solve this linear system for you, okay? And, um, but why do we care, you may say? I mean, I could just call Python to do this for us. Why do I care how exactly is, it is done? Okay, well, um, now how do we know that whether uh, Python did a good job? I mean, uh, is there better ways to do this? Okay, we don't know how it works, how this current algorithm is uh, uh, implemented, okay? How do we know that how fast it does it run, okay? Um, 
uh, if how fast it runs on 1,000 points, or if you know how fast it runs on 1,000 points, that doesn't mean that you know how, how it scales when you have 1 million points. Okay, how do I have some understanding of that? Okay, and um, with this understanding, maybe you realize that, okay, this is too slow. Maybe we can figure out there are better ways to do this, make, to make this more efficient. Okay? All right. So um, that's the first uh, uh, simple example. So here's the second example. Okay? Um, this is another very common data analysis task, the clustering. Okay, essentially, you probably all heard of the word. This is by far um, one of the, uh, the, the most ubiquitous uh, tasks that a practitioner uh, does with data. Okay, so you're given a set of data and you want to identify groups called clusters so that intuitively you want similar data points that they should be grouped together. Well, things that are not similar should be separated into different groups, different clusters. Okay, um, of course, I mean, this uh, groups can look very um, uh, uh, circular like this, or you can also have some other patterns inside. Okay, so it's a very important problem that we come across very often in order for us to make sense of data. The first step, especially when they're high dimensional data and has a huge number of them, and the first thing we do is that we kind of try to cluster them, separate them into different groups, and then try to study each group separately and study the relation between groups. Okay. So here's a more concrete example. So this is the old Facebook geyser in the Yellowstone, one of the most famous geysers there. Well, the name Old Faithful actually uh, partially come from the fact that this geyser, the eruption pad has a reasonably um, somewhat predictive uh, eruption pattern, okay? And say you want to understand what is exactly the pattern behind, okay? So um, what we can do is that we can collect some data and then let's plot it. In particular, here what we collected is the, um, the basically each point means that um, between this eruption and the next, time, next one, what's the duration? Uh, sorry, this is the duration of the uh, eruption and the vertical time is that between this one and the next one, how much time that you have to wait, okay? And once you plot this point, so this each of the point is one eruption, okay? You collect these two numbers. And once you plot them, Visually, we immediately see that indeed it's quite, it's quite um, uh, regular. There are two clusters there intuitively. And one of the cluster is here. The other one is here. Okay. And um, which roughly also means imagine that in DSC 40A, maybe you can even further fit, say, a Gaussian for, for this cluster of points. You fit one Gaussian to model it. And for this one, you fit another two dimensional Gaussian. Uh, to model that. Okay, once you have that, you have a model. In the future, if I give you a duration time or give you a wait time, you can, uh, you can probably predict what could be uh, likely uh, its duration time. Okay? All right. So, visually, human beings are very good at finding patterns in all kinds of complex data. Okay? But how do we give this to computers and ask computer to find these clusters for us? Okay. Now, this is a very simple problem, but in general, the type of data we have is much higher dimensional, much more complex. The number is also much more. Okay, So how can we uh, let computer to automatically identify these clusters for us? Okay. All right, so this is our task, let's say. And um, well, suppose we want to tackle this problem. Okay, again, the first step is that we need to formulate this, we need to model this problem, okay? And again, using um, our, uh, what we learned from BSC 40A, it says that, okay, let's maybe model this as an optimization problem, okay? Um, so we're given this data set, okay? The clustering essentially is a grouping. We need to group it. And suppose we know that I want to cluster them into two groups, okay? So, what we can do is that I can imagine that I need to find a blue group and a red group, okay? And essentially, one grouping candidate, one potential way to cluster them is simply to assign each of the input points to either be a blue or red one, 
Okay, so for example, here's one uh, potential assignment of the blue and the red groups. Okay, then we have a grouping candidate, and when, then we evaluate how good is this grouping, uh, this the, the current uh, grouping uh, choice. Okay, and let's say we take the because you, what you want for the cluster is that similar things are tied together and things that are not similar should be in different groups. In other words, you wanted these groups to be well separated, okay, for good clustering. So that suggests that maybe we can use the minimal separation distance between the blue points and the red points. In this case, it's indicated by this number here. I hope you can see my cursor, okay? So we can use this one to measure how well separated your groups are, okay? The more they're separate, the better they are, okay? So this is our uh, um, the measurement of the goodness of a current uh, clustering candidate, a grouping candidate, okay? What is our final goal? Well, we're given points, say n points, x1 to xn. We would like to find an assignment of all the points inside into blue points and the red points so that the separation, this goodness quality, is basically maximized, okay? So we basically model this clustering problem into this optimization problem. Okay. Of course, uh, there are many, many ways to um, model this as an optimization problem. You can have different goodness um, measurements, okay? This is just one simple example. Now, uh, of course, just now I show a good grouping, okay? They don't have to be like this. It's also possible that I'm going to make all of the points here red, okay? While I make all the points here blue, okay? If I use this as my uh, cluster, uh, the grouping candidates, okay? I sign the blue and the red this way. What do you think? Well, what is the goodness measurement? It's a minimal distance between blue and the red points. And in this case, it's going to be very close because some of the blue points and red points are super close to each other. So this one is not a very good uh, clustering candidate. Okay, so we were aiming to find one grouping assignment to maximize the separation distance. So let's see, I have a question here. Hold on just for a second. Semi-blocked. So um, the... The goodness is the minimal distance between red and the blue points, okay? But want, what do you want to optimize? You want to make this minimal distance as large as possible. So you want to maximize the separation distance, okay? Does that address the question? So there's a question in the chat window, okay? All right. Um, oops, I need to clear this again, okay. Okay, but this is the, how we model this problem. Again, we're back to the question that now you have this good idea and you want your computer to implement it for you, to compute, to find this best uh, grouping for you, okay? What do you do, okay? Now, let's say you are given such a task. Let's try, let's uh, just write our first uh, uh, algorithm for clustering, okay? Um, well, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, by the way, I mean, you, you, this is, in other words, we need an algorithm to implement this idea, okay? And it's very, the first and foremost important thing of an algorithm is that it has to be correct, okay? And now, once we, after we design algorithm, first we have to convince ourselves of its correctness. And then after that, we have to ask ourselves how good it is. And to do this, we need to be able to analyze the algorithm, which is part of what we're going to cover in this course. Okay, and after we are able to, we're equipped with some uh, uh, skills and abilities to analyze how good algorithms are, then when we're given an algorithm or we're designed one, if it's not, if we think it's not good enough, then we want to learn how to design better algorithms. Okay, this is also uh, the later half of the class we'll focus on. Okay. Now for the clustering problem, how do we design an algorithm? Okay. Um, um, so in general, when you are given the problem, okay, especially suppose you are during your job interview, you are asked a question, you are asked to design some algorithm, okay? So don't say that I don't know, okay? Even if it's a naive algorithm, it's still better than no algorithm at all, okay? So let's first, looking at the clustering problem, let's just design any algorithm that can implement the idea which is the, uh, described, okay? 
So what did we say? Um, we model this in the optimization problem. Essentially, we say that we're looking for the, uh, the best grouping candidates whose this goodness measurement is the maximum, is the largest, okay? So then, based on this description, our first approach would be that, how about we simply enumerate all possible grouping assignments, okay? We enumerate the all possible uh, grouping candidates, okay? And for each of the grouping candidates, namely each of the potential clustering, we evaluate how good it is. And now we return the one whose goodness score is the largest. Okay, so this essentially simply follow the optimization problem that we just said. Okay, all right. Now, here is the algorithm uh, to uh, implement that idea. Okay, now let me point out that um, in this class, okay, um, sometimes, given that you've all seen the Python before, especially uh, through the uh, earlier uh, 40A, so very often when I give examples of algorithms, we will use Python, okay? However, if you read an algorithm book, okay, a generic algorithm book, very often people use something called a pseudocode, which is not specifically any program programming language, but it, which is still very, looks very similar to C, but it's just a, a way to write, um, uh, uh, write, uh, write code, okay? So um, you will see both examples in this class, okay? Sometimes I'll use Python, sometimes I just simply using pseudocode, okay? Now, um, it's actually important to also understand pseudocode because sometimes you may um, want to understand how someone else implements an uh, algorithm, okay? That they may not be writing their code in Python. You would have to understand the, their, their specific code or maybe it's, um, there's also pseudocode uh, associated with it, okay? All right, so here, this is a Python code for the high-level idea we just described. So what we do is that um, we basically, we enumerate for every clustering, one possible grouping assignment, okay, in all possible um, grouping assignments, okay, for each of them, we then write a piece of code, so this is a function, to calculate the, to calculate the separation distance. Remember, the separation, minimal separation distance is the measurement of how good this grouping is, okay? Then what this piece of code is doing is that then we keep maintaining the maximum separation distance, okay? Right? All right, actually here it should be, okay, this is a small mistake. This should be uh, bigger than, okay? I'll fix the slide later, okay? Because you want to return, you also always, so you always want to maintain the best the separation, namely the, maximum possible separation distance as the goodness of the clustering. Okay, all right. So that's, um, that's the algorithm we have. Okay. Now we have an algorithm and it's pretty, for the specific one, it's pretty easy to convince ourselves that it is doing the right thing. It is correct because essentially it's following the optimization uh, uh, problem that we just modeled, okay? Now, how about the analyzing the efficiency? Well, um, so when we talk about the efficiency of an algorithm, okay, there are different factors, okay? We can talk about how fast does the algorithm run and how much memory footprint it has in the computer, okay? Let's, for the time being, focusing just on um, how fast the algorithm runs, okay? But the precise running time of the algorithm depends on precisely what programming language you use to implement it and what's the computer you use to run it, okay? So which is very machine, depending on too many variables, okay? So instead, let's look at the things that's canonical across these different computer platforms. Let's intuitively count, okay? How many basic operations that your algorithm have to do, okay? And particularly in this algorithm we just saw, okay? We see that what happens is that essentially, so we have a for loop here, and we need to figure out how many times this for loop is going to run, okay? And how many times does a for loop run? Well, we are enumerating all possible grouping choices, grouping candidates for your input data, okay? 
So the for loop runs in that number of points of times. Okay. So what is a grouping candidate? A grouping candidate, since here we're just separating them into two clusters. So we're basically assigning every input data point, either a red color or blue color. Okay. And if we have n input points, then each one has two choice, either it's a red one or a blue one. So that's basically, you have n of them, that's two times two times two, so each one has two choices. And then the total um, number of uh, possibilities, different possible assignments you have is two times two n times, which is n, two to the power of n, okay? And um, so that in some sense, um, it's, th that's the number of uh, iterations we have in this for loop. And now within the for loop, okay, let's assume that within the for loop, I only need one nano setups for each of them, okay, to, to compute its uh, goodness score and then to update this, um, uh, uh, the, maintaining the maximum separation distance. Suppose it only takes one nano setups, okay? Then what is the time complexity? Well, the time complexity is two to the n nano setups, okay? Okay. How big is that? Well, many of you probably already see this is exponential function, okay, it grows super fast, but let's just uh, to get some feeling of it, okay? So if your input n is your input point, okay? If you have only one point, then it only takes one nanosecond. If you have 10 points, then that already takes one millis uh, microsecond to uh, check all the all this different two to the n number of uh, different grouping candidates, okay? And if you go up to 30, then that already, if n is 30, then you already have to take one second to run this. And if you go up to 70 points, then it grows to more than 37,000 years, okay? And this is probably not surprising because the growth of the time that the algorithm we just described, okay, the growth of the time with respect to the input size. In this case, the input size is n, okay? The growth is basically exponential in input size. Every time it doubles, so it grows very fast and quickly becomes um, uh, uh, not possible to run this. And one, nano, one nanosecond for, for doing those operations is pretty decent, I guess. I mean, modern computers, I mean, if you have multi-core, probably it's a bit faster than that, but it's close to your standard uh, computer, okay? So we cannot run this algorithm because if we run this previous algorithm we just described, um, we cannot even handle 70 points, okay? So it is an algorithm, uh, it's a procedure to help us to solve the problem, but from this, we see that this is not a very good um, algorithm, okay? But how can we do better, okay? All right, um, we will clear it again. Okay, so um, we we're not going to talk about how we can do better for this specific problem now. Towards the end of the class, we're going to come back to this clustering problem. And then we're going to show you another, after whatever we learned, after what we learned through the course, we're going to show another algorithm which runs in almost a linear time, okay, for the same problem, all right? All right, okay. But through these examples, I hope that um, I have made it clear that, um, so this course we're going to talk about the next step, after you already know how to model your problem, but how are you going to ask a computer to solve the problem? How do you design algorithms for, the, good algorithms for that, okay? Well, I mean, but the first, what exactly is an algorithm? Okay, so the term algorithm actually predates computers. Okay, so essentially an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step strategy, a sequence of operations to solve a specific problem. Okay, although nowadays it usually refers to a step-by-step -step strategy, which in terms of the written in terms of the programming language that you feed to the computer for the computer to solve the problem. Okay, and um, now, um, of course, um, uh, for the algorithm to be useful, um, it is important that your algorithm should terminate. And also it should return on the correct answer for every possible input instance. It cannot be that, okay, for this type of input, I'm, I'm correct, but um, if you give me something else, I, I, I'm not sure, okay? So it has to be correct for all possible input instances of all possible sizes. Okay, and the algorithm should terminate. Okay, 
All right. So what does this course, what we want to learn through this course is that we want to have a develop a better understanding of what is a good algorithm. Okay. Now, in order for us, that is so that that help us to later to design good algorithm and also to recognize when we see good algorithms. Okay. But in order for us to even talk about what is a good algorithm, what is the bad one, we need a language to help us to analyzing the algorithm to talk about its performance. Okay. So that's what we will focus on for the first few lectures. We're talking about the so-called asymptotic language that that's used to measure performance of algorithm and how given an algorithm uh, obtain its um, asymptotic um, complexity in terms of time, in terms of um, uh, memory and so on. Okay. So that's the first thing that we're going to encounter in this course. Okay. Well, but um, just that being able to measure, analyze the performance of an algorithm is not enough. We also have to learn how to design good algorithms. Okay, so this through different examples in the class, we're going to see, hopefully we're going to see the effect of data structures. And also there's certain algorithm specific um, paradigm for designing algorithm like divine and conquer that we're going to see in a couple of lectures. Okay, so this help us to later uh, develop, design our own uh, more efficient algorithm. Okay, and also a lot of the problem that we see um, in practice actually can all trace back to certain type of uh, problems. Okay, so for example, um, as I said, I mean there are a lot of problems are essentially classing pr problem in some way. Okay, or um, a lot of problems uh, in data science in data analysis essentially involves that we are I will have to perform certain tasks on a graph. The graph could be your social network or the graph can be some other network, okay? So uh, the second uh, uh, half of the class, we're going to focus on many of these fundamental problems on graphs, okay? Which is uh, really ubiquitous uh, in uh, underlying many applications, okay? We're going to talk about the graph traversal, shortest path, and so on, okay? So that's basically the high level a framework of this course, we're going to talk about how to measure the performance of algorithms, how to design good algorithms, and we're also going to see what are the effective, efficient ways to tackle some of the fundamental problems in graph theory. Okay? All right. Okay. All right, so now let's now come to our first uh, topic, which is that um, how do we measure uh, efficiency? often the performance of an algorithm, okay? Okay, I, I just mentioned that essentially an algorithm um, takes as input some, some input. It could be data or could be some uh, other variables. And then you need to perform the task and also produce, which requires them may produce a correct output, okay? And the algorithm would then give the step-by-step -step procedure for that. Now, when we talk about, but just having a correct algorithm is not enough, okay? An algorithm is only useful when it is efficient enough, when it runs very fast. Otherwise, if it runs 37,000 years, nobody is going to wait for it to finish to get the answer, okay? So um, efficiency really matters in practice. And this efficiency issue actually is becoming bigger and bigger issue because, I mean, nowadays, as we know that um, in this, data error will come we're, we're, uh, coming across larger and larger, more massive data routinely, okay? So when we talk about the efficiency, there are many different types of efficiency we can talk about. The most common one, which is what we're going to focus on in this class, is the so-called running time of your algorithm, okay? So given the specific uh, input size of certain size, what is the time the algorithm need to um, uh, uh, take? Okay, but there are many other aspects you can talk about efficiency too. Okay, you can talk about how much memory, how much space it needs, which is actually also very important, especially nowadays with new deep learning uh, neural networks and all these new paradigms, you want to potentially implement your algorithm on GPUs and so on. Very often you want to reduce the memory footprint. Okay, and if you are talking about say networking, then there's also communication costs. You want to, there are other efficiency measures, okay? But in this class, to keep things simple, let's just focus on 
um, talking about the running time, the time, the so-called time uh, efficient, time complexity of an algorithm. All right. Okay. How do we measure time efficiency? Well, I already mentioned, we saw that when we try to understand the time uh, performance of the clustering algorithm, the, the running time of the algorithm depends on the size of the input, right? So in addition to that, it depends on the computers they are running on, the programming, the language you use to implement things. It also, it also depends, on, even if we forget about those, okay? The running time depends on the size of the input. If my input has only one data point, then I can do many things very efficiently, okay? But if I have a one billion data points, then it becomes uh, the time naturally is much bigger, okay? In fact, not only that it depends on the size of the input, naturally larger size takes longer time, okay? It actually also may depend on the specific input, okay? Let's say that you're given a, 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 a list of numbers, okay? Um, of n numbers, and your task is to sort it in n decreasing order, okay? Now, if your input is already sorted, then I just, once I finish checking, I realize this is already sorted, then I need to do nothing, okay? Then it's very efficient, okay? But if your input is not sorted, then you have to spend time to rearrange it to sort, to sort them in then decreasing orders, okay? So the running time actually has many factors that um, uh, affect it, okay? Um, so let's go with another example, which is similar to our first example. Let's say that um, we want to, similar to our uh, first prediction example, we want to be build a least square regression model to predict the oxygen level of a patient based on different parameter. Okay, we saw earlier that this is essentially solving a linear system. Okay, and let's say that you did develop an algorithm and it trained it on one thousand patients. Basically, the current uh, data size, data set size is one thousand, and let's say it runs in one second. Okay, now. Just by staring at this number that it runs one second on this 1,000 patients, you don't really know that how your algorithm would perform if your input training set is 1 million patients. You don't really know how, much, how long your algorithm would run, okay? Is it necessarily just the 1,000? Because 1 million is 1,000 times 1,000. So is the time just 1,000 times the previous one second? Or could it be longer, okay? Without knowing the algorithm, you actually cannot tell, okay? So because that the running time, the performance depends on the input size, what we want to capture essentially is that what is the growth of your running time with respect to the input size? We have to know that in order to talk about the performance of your algorithm. Because otherwise, it may be that you have an algorithm, when you have only 1,000 patients, it can run very efficiently, run only one second. But then once it goes to 1 million, it runs 10 years, while another algorithm maybe runs um, two seconds with 1,000 patients, but then only runs 10 seconds with 1 million points, okay? So you have to know the growth, how it grows with respect to the input size in order to really have a um, full grasp of how good the algorithm is, okay? Um, I should also point out that um, before we get into the need of having a uh, language talk about performance of the algorithm, you may say that, well, I mean, still, if I only focus on the growth of the algorithm, um, I could just using some, you know, tool, a lot of the programming language or system provide you the tool to time a specific procedure, okay? So what I could do is that I could just, uh, you know, run this algorithm multiple times at a different size and then plot the, the, the running time and to get an understanding of the growth of the running time with respect to the input size, okay? Well, the disadvantage, was, as we already said, is that this depends on the machine you use to, uh, to time your algorithm, to run your algorithm. And also, in order for you to get a full, um, clear picture of the growth, you would have to run many, many times in order to know for each different uh, input size how well the running time grow, okay? In fact, as we just said, even that may not be correct because your algorithm, even for, let's say, you are going to run on the input size of 1,000 1, patients, okay? It may depend on which type of input data is, the running time could be different and it could be significantly different. We're going to see some examples later, okay? So then, yeah, 
in order to get a phase-four plot of the growth of the running time, you'd have to run on many, many different uh, input of the same size in order to get a better understanding of its time complexity. Okay, so this is a very cumbersome way to understand the time, running time of your algorithm. It's not a good way. Okay, so then what we say is that to, uh, using time complexity uh, analysis, what we say is that, okay, let's only focus on the canonical part of your algorithm that is the same across different computers, different machines. Essentially, you want to count just the operations that your algorithm need to take. Okay, and um, of course, you also want to do this without going really running it on a specific computer. You want to look at the algorithm and analyze what is the number of operations that's needed. Okay, and in particular, in order to get this view of understand what is the growth of your uh, time uh, running time with respect to the input size. Okay, you want to obtain a formula, a function of your running time where the variable essentially is your input size, because for different input size, your running time is a bit different, right? And you want to get to that formula, you want to get to that function to understand, okay? Instead of just to try to plot the curve and um, affect the, uh, the time data. Okay, um, so let's look at a simple example um, of um, how we formally carry out what I just described, okay? So let's look at this um, uh, uh, piece of code. Uh, the input is an array A, okay? So what does it do? Uh, it initialized a variable total to be zero, okay? Then uh, N is the size, the length of your array, okay? Then for every element in the array, we simply add it up to the total. In other words, what the total stores is the at the end of the for loop, after we finish the for loop, we basically add all the array elements, the numbers there, on, uh, to total. So total stores the total sum of all the elements inside the array A, okay? And what we return is the average of this total sum. In other words, we're returning the mean value of all the elements in this array, okay? So it's a very simple piece of code here, okay? okay. So we want to analyze its time complexity, its performance in terms of running time, okay? As I mentioned earlier, the first abstraction we're going to do is that since we recognize that this time uh, the time depends on the input size, okay? I'm going to come up with a function. Let's call this function t of n. t stands for time. n is the input size, okay? Because and, and I want to get a formula for this function because in other words, I want to know for different choice of n, what is the time for that size, input size, okay? So this is the first abstraction that we want to do, okay? All right. The second one is that we said earlier that precisely how much time you're going to take differs from computer to computer. Even if you say that you're going to carry out an uh, operation which is A plus B, Okay, on different computers, it takes different time. Okay, so we want to ignore that. So what we say is that let's assume that all the basic operations, each one just take a unit time, take constant time. Okay, some constant, you can give it any constant you like, or just a unit time. Okay, so for example, all operations such as addition or multiplying two numbers, dividing two numbers, or given an array, just access one of the elements, say the ice element in the array. All of this operation, this basic operation, just take constant time each, okay? All right, with the current, this two um, uh, simplification, let's see what we can do. Well, we come to this code. The first we said, okay, um, here, this two line, the first two line, these are just the very elementary, very basic operation. Each of them only takes constant time, okay? So let me say that altogether, the total time this two take is a constant, and let me denote it by C1. This is just a constant, any constant, okay? All right, now, then I come to this for loop. Whenever I have a loop, you first go inside the loop, okay? So we go inside. Inside, I have this line, 
which again is just carrying out an addition. So let's say that this also takes constant time. Let's call this C2, okay? And um, then we return the final uh, uh, answer where we take a division, which is also constant, okay? So what is the total amount of time we need? Well, the total time we need is we have to run C1, okay? But then we have a for loop. So C2 is run the number of uh, uh, the number of iterations of the for loop, which is n, because we check um, the entire range to from zero to n minus one, the range of n. Okay, we check every element in the array. So C2 is performed n times, and then we also have C3. Okay, so when when I add up sum up all the time, this is our time. Or more precisely, I can write it as follows, okay? The time complexity for an input array of size n, so the time com complexity for input of uh, size n is simply has this formula, okay? All right? All right. Well, we're not done yet. If you look at this formula, it's still not great because there's still all these constants hanging here. And do we care what they precisely are? We don't really care because we know that they are kind of, uh, um, they, they, they are canonical for the same machine. Across machine, they're different, but then this is just like, um, if you compare two algorithms on the same machine, then the constant would be the same, okay? So we don't really care about it precisely what is the sum uh, constant. Furthermore, what we really want to focus on is the growth of how fast is your algorithm growing when you increase your input size, okay? This constant doesn't really um, matter so much for the growth rate, okay? And so now that comes to the third abstraction, okay? We already got to the previous time, time complexity formula, okay? Now I want to ignore the constants as well as the lower order terms. Right now, just take this in the hand waving way. So a uh, lower order is, for example, in the, previous, um, in the previous time complexity, I have this term is um, a linear order, okay? And I also have constants. Constants compared to linear order is lower order, so we can ignore all of them. Okay, so I'm going to focus. I'm only going to focus on the dominating terms. Okay, we're going to see more formally what this means later. But right now, we're just going to focus on the dominating terms, and I'm going to ignore the lower order terms and the constants. Okay, for this particular example, I say my time complexity is big theta of n, or in words, this is order. This is a linear time uh, algorithm. Okay, so intuitively, what I'm saying here is that the time complexity of my algorithm, T of n, grows like a linear function, grows linear with respect to n. Okay, questions, this makes sense? Okay, so in other words, we're given, you see, we're given a specific algorithm to analyze, okay? What we said here is that to talk about its time complexity, we essentially want to get a formula of how the time complexity how the running time change with respect to n. So this is usually denoted by a function t of n, where n is the size of the, your input, okay? So in the previous example, the input is an array, okay? The size of it is the number of elements in the array. In our early example of the clustering, the size of the input, we have n data points, x1, x2, till xn, okay? So the size of the input is actually not just that n, it's also the dimension of each data points. Okay, it's actually how much you have to rep, uh, uh, represent the input, which will be n times d if d is the dimension. Okay, um, but so but you want to get is that a function with respect to uh, the, the, the variable is this input size. Okay, you want to get a formula for that, but you don't want to look at all the little meaningless details because that kind of confuses us and lose the big picture. You say, I only want to focus on the highest orders. I want to focus on who is the dominating term here in the time complexity. So intuitively you want to ignore constants and you also want to ignore lower order terms, okay? And the, the simple example we saw earlier, this, um, this one, the time complexity in the end is 
we say that this is the uh, T of n is big theta of m, which is that is a linear time algorithm. Okay. All right. Questions? Okay. All right. Um, th this is just to summarize what I just said. Um, Okay, but um, when we use this, what we just did, you have to be careful that uh, it is not true that depending on your programming language, it is not true that each single command line in your code would take constant time, okay? So for example, uh, for the same task that we did earlier, computing the mean, I could actually call a procedure in Python already, which automatically compute the sum, okay? So this one, basically it calls a function which returns the sum of all the elements in A, okay? So this is essentially, it's not a basic operation anymore, it's a function. And for this function, it actually takes, it's not a constant time, it actually takes time linear to the uh, size of the array because to compute the sum, you have to visit each element in the array, which you have N elements, okay? So when we do the time complexity analysis, this is no longer A. Okay, the time complexity analysis, this will be, it depends on the size uh, of the array linearly because you have to visit every element inside. This will be say A1 times N, A1 some constant. Okay, and this is A2, this is A3, and our final time complexity is the sum of them, which again, we simplify to be big theta of N. Okay, this is just to point out that um, in the old time when we write pseudocode, okay, if you look at a lot of the algorithm textbook, they use pseudocode. Usually each command line is one fundamental one uh, basic operation. You can assume that it takes constant time, okay? However, the moment that your command line calls other function, or later you could have a tree data structure and you call some uh, specific uh, operations supported by, the, by that data structure, okay? then those are not a basic operation anymore. It's actually implemented by another bunch of basic operation. They may not take constant time anymore. So then you have to take that into account, okay? All right. Okay, so as a simple exercise, okay? So uh, you should also think about um, instead of the mean, if I give you an array A of N numbers, okay? how to write a piece of code to return the largest number in A, okay? And what is the complexity of your algorithm? So I will note this is a, a rather similar to what we have before, so I will not uh, go over it here. Uh, you should do it offline, although I do have the solution here. It's very simple anyway. Um, all right, so let me actually summarize to what we just said. I think, um, okay, so, um, what we said is that to measure the time performance, okay, our goal is to obtain a function, we call this time complexity function, T of N, where N is the size of the input, okay? And to, in order to derive this T of N, this formula for uh, T of N, okay, we assume that the basic operations, elementary operations, take constant time or unit time. Okay, and to get a better idea of the growth of T of N, okay, we're going to use a language which we're going to see um, shortly and also next time, the so-called asymptotic complexity language, which is this notation, big theta here, okay? So what this, this um, big theta notation gives us is that it basically only focuses on the dominating terms and ignoring constants and the lower order term. Okay, so this makes it more clear exactly what is the growth of your function. Okay, in the previous case, um, the function is growth linearly. Okay, all right. Okay, so I think I finished a bit faster and it's actually good because um, uh, the next lecture has more material than we have. So let's, let me actually move on to the beginning part of the second one. I will adjust the slides later, or you can also just check out the second one. Okay. Okay. 
So um, now what we want to do is that um, we want to make what we said earlier, that how to uh, really, uh, what is this asymptotic language, this big theta notation we saw uh, earlier. We want to make it more formal, okay? But before we do that, I want to go through a few more examples in deriving this function t of n, okay? And then we're going to come to this asymptotic language, uh, time complexity language, okay? All right. In particular, I want to look at a few um, more complicated examples with nested loops. The simple example we saw earlier has only one for loop, okay? All right, let's imagine that, again, coming from uh, the data science point of view, um, let's say that you are given the so-called median, one median problem, okay? In particular, you're given a bunch of numbers, x1 to xn, okay? You want to, so the problem may not be given to you in terms of this one medium. It says that, okay, you want to find this uh, value h that minimize the total absolute loss, this loss function, which is defined as the sum of the difference between each of the input points to h, okay? You want to find the h that is minimizing this total absolute loss, okay? It turns out that, at least in the 1D case, this is um, the solution, the, the, the H that optimized this loss, let me call it H star here, turn out to be a median of the numbers in X. So if the X is, um, has an odd number of numbers inside, okay, then the median is simply the one, if you rank them in then decreasing order, this is the one in the middle, the, the, uh, the one which is N over two uh, plus one, okay? Or if it's an uh, even number of numbers, then it's the middle two. Either of them is a median, okay? So it turns out that solving this optimization problem that I give you here, essentially is the same as finding the so-called median of an array of numbers in X, okay? I should say that um, we are looking at this toy problem where the input are just a bunch of numbers, okay? But this problem in general, um, it can, X can be a bunch of uh, high dimensional points. Each of the XI number can be sort of as a point in one dimension, okay? It's a point in the line, okay? So, but actually the, uh, in general, um, very often we'll come across situation where we're given a bunch of high dimensional points spread, it, okay? We kind of want to find its center, okay? That's a, um, and the one way to find it is center to rep a single point to represent this entire group of points, okay, is to exactly find the one that's minimizing this loss where the absolute value will be replaced by the distance between x, i, and h, okay? So this is so-called the one medium problem in, uh, in high dimensional case. Okay. At any rate, so for our one dimensional case, it turns out that finding, uh, solving this problem, finding the best h star essentially becomes computing the median of this numbers x, okay? So now I want to develop an algorithm to compute this medium, okay? How do we do that? Well, if I give you some times, I'm pretty sure that um, not only that you can all find a way to, to solve this problem, you're probably going to find a better way than what I'm going to show here, okay? But this is just for the purpose of also presenting the algorithm and the analyzing the algorithm, okay? So here again, is a naive um, idea. Okay, so um, uh, when we're given the problem very often, I would like to first start with an idea, uh, a naive idea to first make sure that I know a solution to solve it. And then we try to think that how is, is this the best? How can we do better? Okay, so here's a naive idea, a first a try for this problem. Okay. So we know that H star, so we want to find H star the median. We know it's one of the input number, okay? So what I can do is that I can simply, again, do it, uh, try all possibilities. I say that H star could be X1, could be X2, could be X3, and so on. And then I compute all of the loss for each of the choice. So I compute the loss if, uh, of X1. So if X1 uh, uh, is H star, what is the loss? If X2 is H, what's the loss? And so on, and compute all of them. Then I return the one where the loss in this case is smallest because we're looking for the uh, uh, the H that minimize this total absolute loss, okay? So that is the um, uh, high level idea. And, and this idea, simple idea is very easy to implement. And to implement this, 
naturally, before I show the pseudocode, let's just imagine mental, like what do I need to do? Well, I need to enumerate it through all possible choices of XI. So H can be each of the H I, XI, right? So that intuitively give me an outer uh, loop, for loop, where I need to go through each of the um, uh, input points, okay? Then inside of this outer loop for each uh, outer for loop for each of the choice, then I need to compute this loss itself. Okay, what is the loss? The loss is basically that we compute for what's the distance between my current age and all the other numbers, the absolute distance between them, and then sum it up. Okay, which again indicate imply that to compute this loss for fixed age, I need another for loop to compute um, the sum, okay? All right, and that's the algorithm here, okay? So what we see is that we first, so this is just to set up, we're going to maintain the best possible H value and the best, best possible loss, okay? The mean value is the best loss, the mean H is the best choice of H, okay? Now the outer for loop, what do I do? The outer for loop, we say that I'm going to enumerate all possible point in X, okay? So, and then for each of the choice of H, I need to compute that loss. To compute that loss, it's a sum. The sum is that I start with the current loss to be zero. Then I simply add up XI minus H, the absolute value of that to the sum, that's it. So this is to compute to compute loss of H, okay? So this part. And then after I compute the current loss, I compare this loss with the one that I maintained. If this is smaller than the smallest the possible loss that I've seen so far, then it means that I found a better way, okay? Then I need to update that. So if it's smaller than that, I need to update the best, smallest loss I've seen so far to be the current one I just computed and also update the choice of H to be the current choice. Okay, and then in the end, I just return the H. So that's the algorithm. Okay, all right. It's a very simple algorithm. As I said, that there are different ways to improve this algorithm to make it more efficient. But um, let's see that um, um, if we're given the, uh, so in this case, we have nested loops. We have two for loops inside, okay? So in general, when we're given nested loops, how do we analyze its time complexity, okay? Now, um, later, uh, we're going to also see other nested loop example where not only other than for loop, there can also be a wow loop, okay? So, uh, but the, the, the principle remains the same. When you have multiple layer of nested loops, okay? You always go inside out. Okay, you first figure out what does the most inner loop cost? Because when you compute the cost of an outer layer of loop, you need to know how much the inner loop takes in order to get a precise formula for the outer one. Okay, so that's why you're always going inside out. So in this case, we have only two nested for loop. If I give you an, an exercise with three, four, a multiple nested for loop, you always go inside out, layer by layer from the inner to the layer. Okay, so now, the inner for loop here we have is the following. Okay, and this is easy to analyze because the, this command line only takes constant time. Let's say call the C1. Okay, and the C1 that need to uh, uh, iterate n times because of the n points in X. Okay, so I'm going to simplify here. So the inner loop for each fixed the inner loop C one times N time. Okay, so that's what we get first. Okay, sometimes the inner loop can be a bit more complicated, but this one is simple, so let me just uh, write it this way. Okay, now let's look at the outer for loop. Okay, how many iterations do we have? 
Well, the same, the number of iteration is n, okay? And within each iteration, what do we have? We have constant. This is also constant because you're just compared to one comparison and the two assignment, which is still constant times constant is still constant, okay? So let me call all of this constant. Let's say that this time C2. Okay, so that means that each iteration of outer loop is C1 n plus C2 because it's in the loop plus this. Okay, so we have C1 n plus C2 for each of iteration of outer for loop. And the number of iteration we have in this case is n. Okay, this gives me C1 n squared plus C2 n. Okay, the total running time, I also have this return, which is C3. So the T of N is simply C1 N squared plus C2 N plus C3. So that is the final formula that we get the uh, time complexity for the next loop. Okay, so now this is a very simple one where the cost within one outer for loop or inner for loop remains the same for each iteration, okay? Later, we're going to look at example. When it's not the same, then you have to then write out the iteration number and then write out what is the cost for each iteration and then sum them up, okay? Okay, but we'll come to the example later, okay? All right, so now this nest of the for loop takes this running time. Again, remember that we don't like have all this uh, lower order terms and uh, um, uh, I lost my chat window on here. We don't want to have all the uh, lower order terms and the constant hanging around, okay? So I want to first simplify this, just like what we said before, okay? So what do you think? In this case, the growth of this function is behaves like what? What do you think? You can type in or you can just unmute yourself. So I already see it here. Well, we see that here now, these are just the lower order terms. Okay, we can ignore them. And the C1 is a constant, I can also ignore that. And as such, this behaves just like a quadratic and squared function. Okay, so this function grows quadratically. And like the previous function we saw uh, that the computer mean, that one was uh, growing um, uh, linearly, this one, the medium is harder to compute than the mean, okay? So of course, what I'm giving here is not the most efficient one, but intuitively, uh, there are better algorithms to compute the medium, but intuitively medium is harder than the mean, okay? All right, okay, so, um, so this is just a, um, the, the, the final time complexity of this algorithm is, um, uh, big theta we call it is of the order, we say that it's of the order of n squared, okay? Is the built-in algorithm maximally efficient? Uh, what does that mean? Can, uh, can you uh, elaborate? What does the built-in the algorithm mean? You can type, the, um, uh, type in there, I'll continue for now. Okay, yeah, as I said, we're going to see how to compute the medium. Uh, um, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I suspect not, okay? So the most efficient algorithm, okay, actually this is a point, just to uh, Benjamin's question. So this is a point I'm going to make later, okay? We have, uh, when we say that whether the built-in function algorithm is the most efficient or not, it depends on how we measure. If we say that we're going to look at asymptotic time complexity, I'm not sure they are using the best. Okay, as we'll see later in this class, the best algorithm to compute the medium is actually linear time algorithm, namely it's a big theta of n, okay? However, it does take a little bit of effort, okay? So it's, um, uh, it's not clear that in practice, and it's also not clear that in practice for typical data sets, it necessarily runs more, uh, uh, runs faster than some other uh, algorithm whose time complexity is seemingly more uh, slowly, 
Okay. In fact, um, an example we're going to give later is uh, for sorting problem. Okay. The best uh, um, uh, running uh, optimal algorithm, asymptotically speaking, for uh, sorting uh, an array of n numbers is um, of the order n times log of n. Okay. So the merge sort will be one such algorithm. But in practice, one of the most popular algorithms people use, and a lot of this um, uh, building function also do, is the so-called quick sort. Okay, now quick sort actually, in the worst case, it's slower asymptotically than n log n. Okay, but in practice, um, especially if you add some randomization into it, it's very fast. Okay, so I'm not sure that um, precisely which version is implemented in Python. It could be implementing uh, this um, one of this uh, randomized version similar to quick sort, which would have expected the running time, which is optimal, but not worst case. Okay, so these terms, right now I'm using this term, but they'll become more clear in two lectures. We're going to come to this point. Okay, all right, that's a good question. All right, okay. Well, but it's not that whenever you see nested loops, uh, if there are two nested loops, you say that that's a quadratic time algorithm, okay? So uh, you have to analyze it, even with the four loops, okay? And when you have while loop, it tends to become much more complicated. Okay, we'll see uh, some exercise later in, in, in next class. Okay, so for this for loop, for example, let's see, what do you think is the running time of this algorithm? I'll give you one minute and then we'll finish this class. So we have two nested for loops. Again, you go inside out. First, look at the inner for loop. How much time does that take? So the inner for loop actually only iterate from n to n plus 10. In other words, the number of iteration is 10 for the inner for loop, right? As such, the whole inner for loops only take some constant time, okay? And the outer for loop, the number of iteration is n, so the whole algorithm takes linear time, okay? All right, um, we'll see more nested loop example later. Uh, right, um, I think I'm running out of time. I'll have this one next time, okay? Okay, so um, I'll stop here. Next time I'll continue with a couple of uh, nested loop example, and then we're going to formally introduce the asymptotic language, okay? Again, you have any questions, feel free to uh, send me email or just post our questions in the uh, campus wire. Okay, all right then. Stop the recording.